we think we should go. That's brilliant. Can I say the warmest welcome to uh, the Drawing Symposium this afternoon, Drawing Lockdown 1. Uh, the symposium is convened by Drawing is Free, also known as Chloe Briggs or the other way around. Uh, and Drawing Projects UK, and it's held in association with the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize 2021 exhibition, which is on show here at Drawing Projects UK in Wiltshire in the UK. Uh, and the exhibition and engagement programme are supported using public funding by Arts Council England. This is a Petra Kucher style drawing symposium. It's in two parts. Part one is today. Part two will be on the 5th of March. But we've also divided the session into three parts. And what I want to say before I hand you over to Chloe Briggs of Drawing is Free to introduce the event is that we'd love you to ask questions in the Q&A function. You can use both the chat and the Q&A function in the webinar format. But it's really great if you make sure the questions you want us to see go into the Q&A format because it's a busy session this afternoon. We're welcoming hundreds of people from all over the world to join us. We have 15 fantastic speakers in the presentation this afternoon uh, and behind the scenes, we'll be managing the questions and answers that you'll have for them. So I'm thrilled to welcome you to the event. We've got lots to hear and lots to find out about. So without further ado, I'm going to hand on to Chloe Briggs, Drawing is Free, to introduce Drawing Lockdown One. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Um, I just unmute myself. Thank you very much. It's amazing being here. It always blows me away that I can be sitting in my little apartment in Paris, kind of connecting to people all around the world in this way. Um, still surprises me after this time, but I, I don't know how it feels to all of you since lockdown almost two years ago, but I feel like I'm emerging from a, a dream. Uh, and I think in the confusion, the, the fear and um, the unknown that we all experienced. So many of us drew um, either connected with drawing that was important to us already or discovered it. Um, and we drew, I think, as a way to steady ourselves in, in uncertain times, uh, literally hold on to the line, I think, it's kind of metaphorically. And as you'll see from these presentations, uh, people, People drew as a way to connect to people, which I do as drawing is free, which has been amazing, life-changing, uh, to record, to center ourselves and calm ourselves as a form of meditation, and to try and make sense somehow of what we, we were and still what we're still living through. So I want to start, I'll be running these presentations from my computer, so you have to excuse the 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 little bit of clunkiness here, uh, but I re really want you to see um, the amazing range of ways that people have drawn um, in lockdown. So I'll just begin part one. So we will start with Susie Hamilton. Susie lives and works in London and is represented by by Paul Stolper. She also works with Hospital Rooms Charity, painting murals in psychiatric units. Recent solo exhibitions include Ecstasy, C19, Paul Stolper in 2021, or Margate Sands, Paul Stolper, 2018. And recent group shows include Bed, Bonska, Bobinska, Brownlee in London, um, including also, sorry, I skip a few, Susie, but Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prowls, Prize 2021, Art Car Boot Fair, Hospital Rooms, uh, again in 2021. Over to you. Okay, so this is called Ghostly Doctors. It was begun April 2020, when a consultant and art collector friend of mine sent me pictures from his ward in Bristol, because he thought the images would appeal. And they did, because a lot of my work involves masks and transforming figures into something slightly frightening and threatening and also mysterious. This was made into a poster by Hospital Rooms. It's the heroic stance of the doctor, mixed media of line and um, wash and pastel, which I've used throughout. And the eyes are very important, these kind of wide-eyed, fearful eyes. This um, followed an article I read in The Guardian about um, nurses on the front line from 
black and ethnic minority communities being particularly vulnerable. And again, it's the wide eyed fear. She's hanging on to a cable, but it's like a lifeline. And there's the heroism, but also the perplexity in her gaze. Uh, this um, a, a sort of angelic figure, because some of my doctors are sinister, a bit like plague doctors or Hieronymus Bosch figures, but some have this um, rather beautiful, I thought, beautiful light coming out of them. And light is an, <clears throat> a, an aspect of my work that engages me. And this neon of the clinical wards appealed to me. This was on cardboard. We had a lot of deliveries sent to our home. Um, we were lucky enough to have that. And I used the cardboard, carving it up to draw on and it's mixed media, pencil, pastel, wash. And it's from the patient's point of view on the bed and the patient's this messy shape looking up at these ghostly, um, unusual hybrid figures bearing down on it. This, uh, again, a combination of mediums and this wash suggests the virus coming out from the doctor's head. Again, it's a hybrid figure, a bit like an ape or, a, or an astronaut or a samurai. I've done these helmeted figures before in my work. And uh, again, looking out into this um, frightening landscape. Here, goggles. I did a huge amount of studies of different respirators, goggles, and, and um, apparatus. Uh, so the human is trapped inside this. But um, as a sort of fr fragility about these marks on the bare paper, as if the sketching and the wiry lines are kind of making an unstable figure. Here, a bit of a Klansman, um, Guston perhaps, image has, has crept in. Um, although I like the Elliot line about the wounded surgeon, so the doctor himself or herself is vulnerable as well as um, dispensing um, uh, healing to, to the patient. Um, these, um, I learned a new word when I was doing these, iatrophobia, which is fear of doctors and nurses, and these nurses look a bit threatening with these massive hands bearing down on us. Um, because unlike Hepworth's work, which people have compared, well, not necessarily compared favorably, but they've mentioned her work, hers is more, I think, caring and gentle. Mine is, is to do with, with fear of the unknown. Um, a little respirator image. Um, in most of these, with the masks, there's this collision of two worlds. One is the familiar world of the patient, and then the other is this odd, uncanny world of the doctors dressed up in all this stuff, this kit bearing in um, as here. And there's this one at the, I like doing processions where doctors or figures are getting progressively more maybe damaged or distorted or transformed as they go on. I like this one at the end, breaking the fourth wall and looking at us with these emoji eyes. The emoji figure actually <laughs> gave a little bit of humor in some of these. Here again on cardboard, I'm a single figure facing vacancy, emptiness, perhaps fear, this bareness and bleakness of the cardboard and this smear of, of maybe a cable or a bit of patient is to me slightly upsetting because the patient is turned into this messy struggling shape and we are seeing things from the patient's point of view we're on the bed and then a figure like this this brown nurse is looking down at us although this one may be more stoical more calm um, less um, less frightening perhaps people have seen it as more peaceful as an image I wanted it to be as minimal and simple as possible um, again, the, um, this was a drawing turned into a larger work, a painting called Monitor. I did a lot of these, the monitors with the strange hierogly hieroglyphic scrawls on the um, screen. And again, the wide eyed fear of these figures peering out of the darkness. And we, the spectators, patients are on the bed looking up at these figures coming in. This was from a quote by Sylvia Plath, a writer who I love. She says, I saw the high bed with its white drum tight sheet and the machine behind the bed and the masked person couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman behind the machine and other masked people flanking the bed on both sides. And it's this mess and, and unruly stu stuff on the bed and then the other figures behind. This is called emergency with a rather gruesome blood red figure and the tense um, pose of the nurse and again the neon clinical light although it's quite pretty in a way but it's chilling as well um, so uh, yeah that and this was um, from a series of a doctor almost lost or static in a forest of cables and wires um, I like the idea of these lines these wiry lines um, contrasting with wash and charcoal, again this media mixed all together. Sometimes I used coffee and tea when I ran out of paint. This again with, with the idea of a virus, um, 
dropping spots of white paint onto the surface over the mesh. And there are the layers of the, the figure, the mesh on the ground of the paper, and then these white spots, this viral load attacking the figure. Um, and the mystery of the silhouette, we don't quite know who it is. Um, again, this is the virus, this very, very dense spattered um, paint and crumbled um, pastel, which I fixed lots and lots of times. And this doctor with the cables in done in charcoal, um, looking out from his or her, or her area of um, fear and perplexity. Um, again, a series of masks with the, with the respirator, a bit like an animal's snout or a warrior or a samurai um, and only covering up half the paper. I quite like leaving these blank areas um, in contrast to the much more busy and dense areas of the acrylic paint and the pastel. This is a bit sci-fi as were most of the, um, many of the images, the masks and the doctors in something like a spaceship. We don't quite know what's going on. Um, it feels urgent, um, but it's, uh, it's slightly surreal, unreal, this setting with the real um, facing an unreal situation. Thank you so much. That is extraordinary how an artist is capable to hold something at the time. <laughs> and you did an amazing job explaining it well done. It's extraordinary. <laughs> extraordinary. I'll, I'll, mute, I'll mute myself then. Yes, please. Thank you. So over to David. David Barron is a sociologist who is also a fellow of Jesus College, Oxford. And he draws a lot. And I, I can I am witness to this. So <laughs> it's true. He does. I'm going to hand over to you, David, and it will start in a second. Thanks, Chloe. Well, I might as well just start. Um, I um, the, the, the reason my my bio is so brief is because I, I did make a mistake of looking at some of the other panelists um, bios and because I have no formal art training and no art, um, accomplishments to speak of, but I'll, a, which is a point I'll return to. Um, later on. What you are going to see is a bunch of drawings that I've done during online lockdown um, sessions, um, starting about two years ago and going on to about a week ago. Um, they're not in chronological order. Um, they're meant to illustrate these kinds of issues that, you know, I'm a, I'm a university lecturer, so I can't resist a bulleted list in a PowerPoint. Um, and uh, uh, so, so the, uh, each of these drawings or several of these drawings will be refer will be related to these sort of issues that I have noticed have been benefits, if, if anything, of doing live drawing um, online. Um, the best groups, like including London Drawing, um, which is my you know my favourite, the one I've used the most, didn't see online live drawing as being a sort of pale imitation of the real thing. Um, they immediately tried to see that there were creative possibilities. Um, and I think the main one, um, I'm not going to speak to every slide, you can look at them as while I'm, while I'm speaking, um, was that the, the artist is in their own space. Um, now, the sort of life drawing events that I typically go to in real life are usually held in the back room of a pub or a drafty village hall or something like that. In fact, there must be terrible conditions for artists, for models to work in. There's very little privacy often and there's nowhere to change and, and so on. Um, and also the lighting is usually awful um, and they have very little input themselves you know into the um, into the event but online um, uh, first of all we often started off by by getting to see people in their own domestic surroundings which is quite intimate in itself but increasingly I've noticed that models have started to think of themselves as being performers and the space in which they're working which of course they control it's their own space um, becomes a set and they rehearse uh, their performances um, with the with the organizers um, in advance. Um, some of the performances, um, like the one on the next slide that's, that's coming up, uh, are part of some sort of formal um, performance tradition. So the one that's coming up, for example, is, is a shibari performance, which is a form of Japanese knot tying, where, where one person ties the other person up in knots and they eventually they end up suspended from a, from a, from a rig. This drawing was done on tracing paper, so the idea was to try and get some sense of the of the performance unfolding. Although I don't think it really comes over very well in the in the photograph. Um, and this is um, a buto performer called Furzan. Buto is a form of Japanese um, dance, although Furzan is actually in Mexico. Um, and this drawing was in one of the hallmarks of buto is that they, the dancers think of the space around them as, as being as important as the body and so here i was a bit like you know we artists think of negative and positive space 
Um, it's also a very emotional style of performance. Um, uh, emotions tend to be negative ones, it has to be said, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's very, it's very and, and, and particularly sort of darkness and decay are, are, are often mentioned as, um, as, as examples of, 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 of performance, which is what I was trying to get over in that, in that drawing. But even those that don't follow um, a, a, a formal sort of performance tradition um, will often um, wear costumes, use props, have backdrops, um, and it's it's a it's a completely different experience. The performance, I think I might just mean to see the Arnish Kapoor exhibition in Oxford before I did this one. If you've seen it yourself, you'll know you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, the um, it's a completely different experience because the the model stroke performer is part of a collaboration, effectively, um, with the artists rather than sort of just being told what position, what pose to adopt by a by an organizer. So the, the creative potential is, is vastly en, 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 enhanced, certainly in my experience. I'm sure these things could in principle be done in real life, but perhaps if you're in London or somewhere like that, you do have the opportunity to go to them, but certainly in a, in a relatively small place like Oxford, um, you don't. So, so uh, that's, that's been a massive um, uh, change. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, um, to, to refer to was is essentially is to come back to the point that I'm not somebody that has had a formal art education or indeed has been involved in drawing for all that long. Um, in, in, in real life life drawing, usually the only person there that's had any kind of formal art training, again, in my experience, is the, is the tutor. Being able to participate in online events, not just life drawing, but certainly including life drawing and indeed including a lot of the events put on by um, Drawing Projects UK, is that they facilitate interaction between people who have had formal art tr training and those of us who haven't. Um, now, I, as a, a sociologist, as Chloe mentioned, and one of the things that I'm interested in, or sociologists generally are interested in, is the, the way in which social groups develop their own cultures and languages. And, and artists certainly have such a language. Um, it's, this is not a criticism, it's probably essential, you know, difficult to talk about um, art in words. So a shared vocabulary is, is, is important, but it does have the unintended side effect of creating potentially a sort of barrier um, between the, the world of the formally trained artist and, and the rest of us. And probably the biggest impact that going to like online events has had on me is, breaking down those those barriers. You know, two years ago, I would never have dreamed of coming to an event like this, let alone speaking at one. Um, and you know, it's certainly a tribute to, to, to growing projects in particular, you know, that, they've, that they, they're so open and, and accessible to, to all sorts of people. Um, the last slide, um, which is just about to come up, is the one I did a week ago. Um, and this was done at one of Growing Project UK's own online live drawing um, events. Um, and um, uh, I, I believe there are more to come, uh, and, and they're very good, so you should look out for them. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was so much to think about. <laughs> Amazing. I want to keep talking to you about this <laughs> another occasion. Over, so now over to uh, Zara Z Zagani. The themes of her practice include control, data, and the Japanese philosophy of Kodowari. This initially stemmed from an interest in acts of contrition, linked, linking to absurdism and the myth of Cepheus. This has led to work with repetitive actions, performance and drawing, drawing as process to the drawing becoming the resolution. She exhibits both nationally, internationally, most recently as a finalist at Wells, at Wells Art Contemporary and at Bournemouth Emerging Arts Fringe. She also leads art in a small secondary school in Dorset. Over to you, Zara. Okay, thank you. Um, my drawing journey, and it is a drawing journey, started um, by a chance encounter at the start of the first lockdown in March 2020 with a, um, a woman in tears in the supermarket, which really got me thinking about mental health at this time. Um, obviously, as a teacher, um, I deal with students with mental health issues a lot, as all teachers do, but also we have our own mental health to look after. And um, at home, I had a roll of paper um, 
and I decided I'd just start drawing. I'd, I'd draw my way through the virus. I would try and control the virus by drawing it. Um, and this is the start of the drawing. And it's, to my mind, looking at the end, which you'll see later, obviously, it's um, quite crude. It's quite uncertain. I wasn't really sure where I was going with it, which really echoed the time, um, you know, March 2020, thinking about um, lockdown and living with lockdown, we were all very uncertain. And when I started the drawing, I thought, um, oh, well, I've got this roll of paper. It's about nine meters long. Um, it, it will stop at some point, but it just went on and on. And as I was drawing the, uh, doing the drawing, I um, started recording the dates and the times and the minutes um, in, in my sketchbook. And that became, um, quite obsessive, as obsessive as the drawing, because the drawing is very obsessive. Um, and it became comforting to see how I was spending my time and that my time wasn't wasted. And one of the things that I'm interested in is time and how we spend our time and making time count at this time. Um, and I, I wanted to, um, to show that I wasn't wasting my time. Um, so we're going into details now and you can see different emotions happening at different points. Um, the darker areas, I, I remember a point in November of 2020 when the country was in lockdown and I was still at school and that was the point at which I felt most anxious. And there were other times where, um, in this one, where it's summer and there's a kind of acceptance and this became quite meditative and I, there's a huge section where all I've done is just draw these shapes um, and um, it, it, it became a comfort. Uh, I started to think about the composition of the piece because as it grew, I couldn't look back. I didn't have enough space to roll it out because it became so long. Um, but what I did have from the start was this kind of snake weaving in and out. And the more that I drew, the, the more complex the shapes became. Um, this, is, this is one of my best circles. I'm quite obsessed with trying to draw a perfect circle freehand. Um, and that, that obsession is, is absurd, um, but also links to Kodawari. And, and it's more about doing the best that you possibly can. And this this drawing this this part of the drawing here just doing this bit took me 23 hours and this is something that i've done in subsequent drawings um since in this year since the lockdown has finished and the drawing has finished and you can see it's it's really detailed these are tiny tiny circles and i got a lot of satisfaction from drawing them and a lot of backache as well because i was working very closely to the piece the piece also becomes more and more complex as it goes along. Uh, I can see I'm gaining new skills. Um, this image here is me working in isolation. And that, that was something that, that really changed me over lockdown was I accepted the isolation and I started to cover that time alone. And when I finished the drawing, I was quite sad because I didn't have that time alone anymore. This is getting much later on in the drawing. And if you look closely, you can see there are kind of bubbles going through it. And that kind of started around the time when people were talking about social bubbles. You can also see that the skills are improving and that there are layers to this drawing. I didn't want it to be a flat drawing. I was looking at perspective. I was always looking at new ways in which that I could make a mark. Um, and it becomes more complex as it goes along. you can also see that it's beginning to ripple out. Um, this is towards the very end of the drawing and there's layer upon layer, whereas I would have maybe just done one layer. I was looking at how I could make it look like there were lots of layers. Um, and this is one of my favorite bits and it's right at the very end of the drawing and it's kind of giving it a ripple effect that the, the virus is rippling out. Um, and that that is the very end of the drawing, which, I, I was really surprised I'd got there. I'm really surprised that I'd drawn so much and I was really looking forward to finishing it. But then there was this sort of anti-climax when I had finished it because it was, 
it was done, what was I going to do now? Um, I was part of Bournemouth Emerging Arts Fringe in uh, June time. And because the drawing is 8.8 .8 metres long, it's really hard to present it. And Carol Maund at, at Beef suggested that we put it in waves, which seemed really apt. Um, and then here, this is it at Wells Cathedral, which was the, the only time really I've been able to roll it out. But what's been really nice about this is that I've had the chance to speak to viewers and found that the, the piece really resonates with people. We've kind of had this um, collective experience individually. Um, and this is the data. So I typed up all the data, I put it all onto a spreadsheet and there's 24 pages of it. And that is gonna form part two of the piece. I'm currently looking at the ideas of perhaps a sound installation. I've tried recording my voice in a kind of shipping forecast way. Thank you so much. That is extraordinary seeing it in the cathedral setting. It, it, it's something, again, there's gonna be things to talk about afterwards. Amazing, thank you. Um, so over to Faye, who's an archeologist academic writer, curator and artist and trained a trained archaeological illustrator with a developed practice in conceptual drawing. Her work is a process of excavation and unraveling of layers of time, memory and substance. substance. It is a philosophical inquiry and experience concerned with sustainability, trace, elements, the senses, inscription and corporal interplay. Over to you, Faye. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Chloe and Chloe, Anita and Fiona for this um, wonderful um, event of gathering of people who draw and people who are interested in drawing. In the introduction, um, Chloe very uh, outlined my work there, a process of excavation and unravelling of layers of time, memory and substance a philosophical inquiry and experience, interested in trace elements and sustainability. It's about the body, it's about corporeal interplay and site-specific work. Connemara Fractals 9818 are a series of drawings that are a haptic act of inscribed remembrance for the artist and cartographer Tim Robinson, who died of COVID. 19 during the spring 2020 wave of pandemic. Tim and I were in conversation a few years ago during a time when we were both mapping the landscapes of Connemara and the Burren on the west of Ireland. In 1998 and later in 2018, I found myself on Renvar Beach, which was the beach you saw in the previous slide, um, that is in Connemara. And both of those instances were research-based. In 1998, my work was a comparative phenomenological study of the placement of ancient megalithic tombs that formed part of a research project into perception of place and new ways of approaching archaeological fieldwork methodologies, such as ways of walking, ways of drawing, and ways of documenting and embodied cartography. In 2018, it was to visit nearby Interface in R to discuss holding a residency there. On each occasion, I collected two stones representative of the unique geological Dalradian str stratigraphy of the area, white quartz and Connemara marble, also known as Irish green. These collected stones formed two pairings, and they are pairings that are imbued with locale, and history, connection and memory. During the first 2020 lockdown, I held these stones as an act of evocation of Renvar, this wild, beautiful, open space. And then on hearing of the passing of Tim, my holding of the stones became moments of ritual remembrance. And because of that, I started wrapping the stones in permatrace, which is a technical drawing paper used in, in the archeological field, such as excavations. I picked up a pen, and I started moving the nib around and across the shapes and contours of the rock, rather like a, a linear rubbing, let's say. And through this act, I felt the strong sense of place emerging through my touch and my inscription. Once unwrapped, the drawings started to take on the topography of Renvar, a micro version of the wider landscape 
rather like the fractals that Tim Robinson describes in his writing, a Connemara fractal. These drawings are a quiddity, the inherent nature or essence of someone or of something, of Tim, of Remvile, of 1998, of 2018, of 2020. This process of wrapping memory and inscribing landscape. They reference his work and his writing on map making and on my work as an archaeologist and in conceptual drawing. Collectively, they are drawings that are uh, hold the, the essence of geological and archaeological terrain. They also hold a deep time cartography of senses and sense of place. And I've started layering this work, starting to think about the site-specific nature, the, the macro and the micro, and how drawing, in a sense, and particularly in these drawings, uh, has the capacity to hold all of this like three-dimensional time and place within the nib of a pencil or the nib of a pen. And so to quote um, Tim and Tim's work from my repetitious footsteps to this repetitious handwork. It is also a caressing of the earth. A soothing and taming of the fractious fractal itself. And in the last sentence of his um, essay, Connemara Fractal, he rounds off with this final sentence, which seems very fitting for the nature of this presentation. To be true to the nature of fractals, I should go on indefinitely. But in this world of practicalities, I must at this point, abandon the tangled tail. Thank you. Sorry, I was just finding my unmute button. That was beautifully, I love the change of pace, Faye. You brought us really into a different space there. Thank you, beautiful. Um, I just moved move your slides along. So over to Emma, who is the last presenter, Emma Carlyle, who's the last presenter of part one. Uh, Emma is an illustrator, artist and lecturer living in Plymouth, Devon. She's taught for the last six years on the illustration course at Plymouth University. And during the pandemic started teaching online via Patreon. She likes pencils, pens, and now I understand penguins too. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Emma. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Um, uh, so here we go. Um, so like a lot of people I know, I ended 2020 completely burnt out, both emotionally and physically. And this is how I spent the first few weeks of 2021 in my boyfriend's dressing gown, playing Animal Crossing online with my friend, Harriet Lowther. I understand the importance of rest, but I was struggled with the lack of willingness to draw and drawing quickly became something I should be doing rather than something I wanted to be doing. Me and Harriet had been doing other online drawing classes together during 2020. And even though we lived three hours away and never met, we quickly bonded by sharing the work we'd made in the classes via WhatsApp. 
During that burnt out January, she sent me a link for a live drawing class, which was being hosted by Miss Muse Draw in Melbourne, Australia, meaning the class would start at half eight in the UK, which felt unmanageable for two burnt out husks. But we did it. And at the end of the class, after sharing our work, we said, same time again tomorrow and Breakfast Club was born. We set up a recurring Zoom link and promised to meet each other every morning at half eight to draw online. As it became a regular thing, we invited other mutual friends along. Frances Ives was the first to join us and it began to give us something of that connectivity, which was lacking during 2020. After a few weeks, there were seven of us in the group and I'll share their work within this presentation. Becca Hall, Harriet Lowther, Frances Ives, Sarah Dyer, Emily McKenzie and Lucy Salmon. And although at the time none of us had met in real life, we were brought together by this love of drawing. Not only did these sessions give us a connection through drawing, but also a routine which had been seriously missing in my life. Uh, starting my day drawing, laughing and singing boosted my mental health in a time which felt so uncertain. And with the help from these amazing women that should be drawing went to back to being, I want to be drawing. Um, we each took it in turns to bring reference imagery, which we would all draw from and share in our WhatsApp group. Through this, it became more than just drawing as we started to learn approaches, techniques and materials from each other. It pushed us creativity, creative, uh, creatively without the external pressures of it being for something, which as illustrators, I think we all struggle to escape from. This led to some amazing drawings, but more importantly, it led us to embrace the drawings which weren't perfect. And as, a, as Sarah reminded me earlier this week, we often encouraged each other to make the worst drawing possible. I think that lesson of letting go and not worrying and learning from mistakes in turn helps you to produce even better drawings, but how often do we set aside time for that? What I took away from this intensive period of drawing was that my work didn't noticeably change, but my mindset towards creating did. It didn't matter what I was drawing or how good it was. It was about the importance of showing up each morning and moving my hand around the sketchbook that really mattered. And as I can, as, and I still can see the lasting effects of this a year later, we don't currently meet up every morning to draw, but I do squeeze drawing into my day. And I also prioritize it above other jobs to give myself that time and space to draw, even if it's something I wouldn't normally choose or links to my commercial or teaching practice. But Breakfast Club grew and it became more than drawing every morning online. And we forged this really beautiful supportive friendship where we can ask each other for advice around work, drawing or life. And as lockdowns lifted during 2021, we were able to meet for the first time. Oh, I'll just wait for that slide to catch up, hang on. There we go. Uh, which was a little unusual after seeing each other every day for weeks, um, only through a screen. But as you can see, I think we all shared that same uh, energy <laughs> uh, and uh, love of hats. And even though we were still technically doing what we'd done every morning for weeks on end, coming together to draw the same thing in front of us was actually really, in, it was actually really interesting to see how we all approached the same landscape and objects differently, um, how we'd all focus on different parts of the same thing. You can see that there on the image of the right, all sat in the same area, all drawing the same building, all drawing something completely different. So I've talked a lot about me and my friends, but this is where it gets exciting for me anyway. Uh, whilst we all shared our work online, we were asked by others in comments and messages if they could join Breakfast Club. And I could see that others were also searching for this routine and connectivity through drawing. So when I shared this video of a month's worth of drawing every day with my patrons, I mentioned um, about them setting up their own drawing groups through the comments. And later we moved this conversation to our Discord channel. In February 2021, inspired by our original Breakfast Club groups, I added extra online drawing sessions to my patron um, to kickstart the year. And these are now attended regularly twice a month and have been for a year. Um, I, they're hosted by myself. I bring the images, we set the times and we draw and laugh for an hour and then share our work at the end. And my patrons also started connecting together to form their own groups, which are attended by people all over the world. I've lost track of how many there are now, but I think there's at least three breakfast clubs happening um, per week. Plus I think a recent one that started this week in the US. 
and they are hosted by patrons and they bring their, their images and they set the times for the, for the drawings. When I first set up my patron page, I wanted it to become a community space which supported others whilst they navigate their creative journey. But encouraging others to form breakfast clubs has meant it's become everything I could have ever imagined and more. Because it's not just about drawing, it's become bigger than that. Um, yes, uh, you get to draw each week. Um, and there's now almost a, a breakfast club session happening every day set up by different patrons. Um, it's about forming friendships, which I know have now extended outside of Zoom and breakfast clubs and people have been drawing together in real life the same way our breakfast club did. Uh, this photo was kindly sent by one of my patrons this week. This is one of their drawing clubs. And although I'm very jealous that they now all draw more than I do, I'm so, so proud of this lovely group of patrons who have made huge jumps in their creative work. And I'd like to think breakfast clubs are part of that. Thank you so much, Emma. It just looks so fun. It makes you want to draw seeing all those, <laughs> seeing all those, those sketchbooks. Um, we now have short time for some question and answers from the audience. So I'll stop sharing the screen and I know that Anita will be fielding those. That's all good. I mean, what five fantastic presentations to start the symposium and we've driven our way through understanding what it's like in health and well-being context. We've understood solace, reflection. Uh, we've understood community um, and the capacity of drawing to form a community, which of course is uh, a really important thing. And the fact that drawing starts something, but things become bigger than it. it. It has the capacity to deal with everything that we address in life. So we do have some questions. Most of them are technical for our five speakers. Um, but we do have one which came in, which I'd like to start with before we uh, talk about technicalities, because we may be able to answer those in the chat. Um, but there's a question which came in during Zara's uh, astonishing presentation, but I think the question might actually be for everybody, I think, uh, which is, did you feel in any way pressured to create during these times? And it's from someone who describes themselves as a still learning artist, who started to share their work online and felt that they should be creating because we had uh, on our hands all this time to create. So what were some of the most challenging things for you and your creative process during this time? So if I can start with Zara, and I'm going to ask that question of all of you. Um, I think for me, it was quite the opposite. I, I saw it because I had more time, you know, my, my commute to work is about two hours a day. So I had two hours extra a day. And I, I kind of think that it, um, it enabled me, it gave me time. I, I couldn't get involved in a social life. So my social life was my drawing to, to the point where actually I kind of maybe got a little bit annoyed if I got interrupted by people. <laughs> because I saw the achievement in the amount of time spent each day because I, I felt like I was achieving something. So for me, I, I think it's, I think definitely the opposite. I think it enabled me. There wasn't the pressure. That's brilliant. Does anyone else want to come? I mean, you've all talked to it to some degree, but actually just refocusing uh, on that might be a lovely response. I don't know if anyone else would like to, to okay. talk to that. I rather agree with with you that it was uh, less pressured and I enjoyed being in my cell, well, with my husband and we just got on with our work. And uh, it was great just being able to focus and not have any social distractions. And it made me kind of dive deeper, I felt. Thank you, Susie, that's a great answer. Uh, anyone else want to join in? Uh, Gar um, Faye or? David? You can be I, um, oh, Play first and then David. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. That's a great question, Anita. Uh, I think we all learnt in the conversations that I had with colleagues, um, academic colleagues and artistic friends and colleagues, um, we learnt about the nature of productivity and, and the, I found the lockdowns, you know, um, had many waves and ebbs and flows to them. But it was an invitation to stop being productive for a while 
and to think about my writing and my making um, slightly like a reclaiming it back somehow and that time and that stillness um, uh, felt uh, a, an invitation to take a deep breath and just think about um, making and writing um, in a, in a non-productive way, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. And David, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I was just going to say for me, it was a lifeline, really. Um, the, um, you know, I live on my own and I was working from home, you know, without that kind of activity to, to I don't know, I mean, I, I, would, I would have been even more insane probably than I, than I, than I was in any case. It was, it was really, a, it really was a, a, a lifeline, a lifeline as far as I was concerned. Perfect. Thank you. And I don't know, Emma, if you want to say anything else in a way, your your presentation spoke to that completely. Yeah, um, I, was just, um, I was just going to follow on what David said. I also lived alone during that first lockdown um, and it became a lifeline like uh, most. I think those who follow me online, you'll know that I went through a really tough time during 2018 and drawing became drawing saved my life in that sense. And I think when the pandemic hit in 2020, it was the same thing. Like I knew drawing had saved my life before so it was just like using drawing as a way of uh like a coping mechanism but I, I've mentioned at the start that feed, I think the question the person who asked the question used the word should be drawing and I think just question that should like to, to, like that's such a it's such a weird word to you like a weird word um and like that should and want um so yeah I think want it like there's that want to draw and I think uh yeah, don't feel pressured into drawing like it, it, it should, it should, <laughs> it, it's uh, something that feels natural, I think. I, th I think those are all really great answers. And I think, you know, the capacity of drawing to provide a lifeline to see what you're seeing, seeing, thinking, feeling and documenting and recording in all the different ways that you did that uh, as a panel. Uh, I mean, I think is a really extraordinary testament to the value and capacity of drawing during actually what's been the most astonishingly isolating, complex, difficult time. And the balance of in learning how to deal with that when we live very fast paced lives and where there's some relishing of that and also some challenge faced by that. I think they've been really five fantastic presentations. Now we do have more questions, but I'm going to hold some of those Till we get to the end of the session because we're at 10 to 4 um, so I'm quite keen that we move on to the next set of presentations but I'd really like to wholeheartedly thank the five of you for five fantastic presentations that raise so many questions and give us so much inspiration thank you thank you thank you I'm going to just share the screen again We'll go on to the second set, part two. Uh, we start with Katia Robin, who draws, paints, makes artist books, editions, and writes. Her artist books are held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art Library. Joan Flash's artist book collection, Yale Art Cent Yale Center for British Art, and other special collections. Exhibitions include Art Language Location in Cambridge in 2012, Living Numbers, Fringe Arts Bath in 2013. I'm going to jump a bit, Katia, to get this into and Trinity Boy Wharf. You were in Trinity Boy Wharf 2019. You're currently working on a publication with At Drawn Together Collective, and you help organize exhibitions of small contemporary paintings with prosaic. That for is eight ninety seven. Over to you, Katya. Hello, everybody. Um, so go, I'm going to start from 2019 when I started doing a lot of work about cleaners and cleaning materials, and it's a subject um, I've sort of that's been there for me for a long time. This one's called Wipe, and it's about a, a meter high. Um, and it's an image as if from the other side of the window or below a glass surface. Um, and it's a painting, but I sort of class it as a drawing because it's all about the marks and it's those gloves, the yellow, yellow gloves are cut into. This one is called Mopping, Drawing a Line. And it's this kind of dissolved space. And it, this is stuff I saw, but I sort of worked from, also worked from online images. So it's an experience. I've spent a lot of time sitting in hospitals 
Um, this was my last drawing before the pandemic. And I don't know if you can see in the gray area, there's the receptionists and behind there's the seats of patients lolling around. We don't have those seats like that anymore. We're all socially distanced and we don't even have green goo. We've got to have transparent goo. This was from my first time in hospital. So I declared myself as artist in residence inside the NHS. You can see on the calendar on the wall, it's the 1st of April. 2020, I was woke up in hospital. It was not a joke. It was awful. This is a cleaner wearing plastic bags as PPE. This is a collection of drawings of other patients in bed, but they kind of reflect my own story, being bed bound for a long time and really ill. Um, another patient gave me a pencil. I had nothing it'd been taken away from me so I was ready for surgery and um, I had this tiny sketchbook and I just hid it in my bed and, and um, now and then I'd draw and it literally was a lifeline maintaining my identity as an artist and instead of seeing it as a sort of like disaster that I might die it's seeing I could paste the mark and I sent these out on Instagram and people responded because I couldn't phone anybody and I couldn't have any visitors. And it was a way of like, yeah, this is what's happening to me. I'm here. This is drawings I did afterwards, right? And it's based on Nan Goldin's photograph of um, the ballad of sexual dependency. And it's about the vulnerability, and perhaps the kind of like aggression of that figure about going inside um, internalizing in a sort of bad situation and then everything went black I couldn't draw I was out I was in a coma I was in surgery that went on for quite a long time and when I came round I was delirious for a long time and I've sort of used drawing, I'm beginning to use drawing to find some way to fill in those gaps. This is, I had really weird um, beliefs and I, that people were parts of the machine. This is getting better when at least I could see, yeah, those lumps in the bed were my legs. Um, and I sort of beginning to sort of land back in our reality. Um, but all this came from a very sort of like em embodied remembering. This is an exercise I did with an online class. The first sort of work, work in quotes I did afterwards was this series of blood transfusion bags. And I made it as simple as I could so I could do it because I lost movement of my hands. Um, and this is part of my learning to draw again. Um, and this is to say thank you to people who gave me the blood. This is watching the bag slowly transfuse into me in the middle of the night, exhausted and not quite with it. Thank you. And this is sort of thinking about having open heart surgery and it's sort of like it's between the blood bag and the organ and blood clots. And it's just a way of facing what had happened to me. Um, and yeah, very much about this visceral experience. I've done quite a lot of memory work. This is again, beginning to think about cleaners again, and a sort of like a ghost-like, it's an A1 drawing, as a ghost-like night cleaner or in delirium and this dissolving space. Um, and again, using like different strategies to go back, pull it up. This was, um, very much more graphic style and it's a, sort of about the kind of brash, some of the uh, staff being quite brash and forceful because they've got jobs that involve bustling around and um, yeah, about the work of cleaning and how it takes it. I'll jump here to um, on the drawing correspondence course. It was an opportunity for me to kind of think about the marks on my body, the collateral damage and everybody else had been um, marking my body and for me to just say, what has happened here? Um, 
so it's beginning to take some kind of um, ownership of it from a, from um, a prompt we use thinking about the body as a votive um, and as a sort of like, you know, the preciousness of the, of the body, but it's also about, yeah, and finally this one's thinking those same sorts of prompts, but also about armor and a repaired kind of um, breastplate um, and like sort of ancient, um, uh, yeah, forms of sewn armors. Um, and yeah, patination of copper and thank you. Amazing. The use of colour, Katia, was so powerful in that. That was a one visual experience. <laughs> well, so experience in so many ways. Over to Joe Lewis. Thank you. Um, Joe is a British artist based in London, trained in Edinburgh and the Ecole de Beaux Arts de Valence. Um, Joe makes ink drawings exploring dynamism and flux in nature. In 2020, she was shortlisted for the Edge Arts Visions of Science Award and last year presented her work at the Drawing Research Network annual conference. Past projects include large-scale installation in Beijing and in London for the Bank of Australia. Jo has exhibited in UK and Paris and done many, many other wonderful things. Over to you, Jo, sorry. <laughs> Where's first? Um, hello, hello, everybody. Well, my drawing practice did change radically in lockdown. Uh, for two decades prior, I always work outside in moving water, making drawings that explore the dynamism of nature's constant flux. But in March 2020, that no longer felt doable. So I revisited some drawings like the one on the right, um, using made with them using the movement of my breath. You just using an ink solution blowing, and I began to explore the ebb and flow not outside but within us as both subject and medium. And like working with water, I wasn't fully in control. It was a collaboration. It is a collaboration. Um, I'd actually made my first breath drawings after my father died from pulmonary fibrosis. Each gasp he struggled and succeeded to take was literally life extending. And I wanted the new breath drawings to somehow celebrate this constant fluctuating connectivity with life. Um, often bubbles of blown ink wanted to cluster. They wanted to land aside and on top of each other. A lot of the drawings are quite small. They required to be seen close up. Um, it felt that they were sort of searching, seeking the intimacy that so many people were missing at the time. I love the strength of the single breath, one breath. These are a bit bigger, uh, about 80 by 60 centimetres. And each drawing seemed to move towards that sort of constant interplay of strength and fragility within us. Each drawing is just one single breath. These uh, other drawings in which breaths juxtapose, oscillate, almost touch, but maybe not quite. And I was experimenting constantly with different ink solutions. I used alcohol, water, glycerine, sugar, soap, anything, um, trying to find different ways to let my boat, um, let my breath draw. And in 2020, of course, talk of breath was everywhere. Our breath had become something to hold back, to keep away from each other. It was almost a weapon and certainly a danger. Yet breath, of course, is our life. It's our constant interconnectivity with the air and ecology around us. And the lines of breath um, sort of explore that intimacy, explore that connection, but also celebrate the individuality of each breath and its playfulness, because we can ignore our breath completely, but then in less than a split second, we can willfully change it and do what we want. I was Googling madly and I Googled things like, does the earth breathe? And I then sent a mad email to the world leading physicist on breath. His name is Professor Jack Feldman in California. And before I knew it, we were having weekly Zooms on Monday evenings and he was an incredibly, or he is an incredibly articulate and poetic explainer. He told me how each breath begins and the neuron choirs. And I made large drawings inspired by these conversations, trying to visualize what happens in the depths of our brain. I called the series Murmurations. They're about 150 by 100, 100 centimeters each, and very much thinking about what Jack could explain to me about these neuron choirs. Uh, two more murmuration drawings. No preconceived composition. They just found their own as I made them, which was actually quite like the small scribbly drawings I made during our weekly Zooms, um, as I sort of navigated his amazing wisdom and clarity. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I've always made books, usually from work made at the river, but little by little, the books became a space where the river work and breath drawings um, could coexist together. And this, this has started happening in the books, nowhere else yet, but in the books. Um, on the left is part of a series made after murmurations. You can see pencil lines are coming into it. And on the right, just a wall in the studio, um, exploring a lot of different breath drawings and surfaces and papers and um, pencils. There was a real intensity to the making of the work. People have talked about that already, but it almost, you know, the, the, the studio was my space. It was my, it, somebody used the word cell and that resonated a lot. Um, I was filling the walls and I was filling the floor and then I was piling it all up and starting all over again the next day. And, and um, this intensity then came into the drawings themselves and the breaths, lots and lots of breaths uh, were landing on top of each other and colliding and multiplying and juxtaposing. And I just kept going. Um, these ones almost use a grid-like form, but I, in using that sense of repetition, I, it was about noticing the individuality of each breath, as Jack had talked to me about, um, the amazing difference every time our brain instigates a breath in our chest, rather than the similarities. And little by little, the work was going out in the world. These works, very small, tiny things, moved up and mounted on wooden blocks uh, for a show last summer. And this was also um, for a project last summer that I made breaths in a Petri dish. Um, again, tiny in scale, but there was something about that that I really, I really enjoyed because it, it sort of drawed one physically in to notice um, something that I felt I'd been drawn in to do very physically. And this is a CD cover I designed for a musician who actually just contacted me on Instagram and um, she asked me to design the cover for her album, which was due to come out in late 2020, but of course didn't because it wasn't launched till last November when she could um, do some live gigs to launch it. And really importantly, the context to all of this work was a new community of drawers, old friends and new, connecting over regular Zooms. I had drawing is free sessions on Mondays. I had my Zooms with Jack. I had Zooms on Wednesday with three friends where we also drank beer and meditated and drew all at the same time. And all these things were incredibly restorative, insightful and energizing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, it's beautiful. Again, we have breath here. We also had touch with Faye. We have these, these, um, these senses that are so intensified in this time. Um, thank you to think about. Next is uh, Ariana Mile Milesi. Ariana graduated in Byzantine art history at the University of Milan and a visual arts illustration at the European Institute of Design, also Milan. She is a multidisciplinary artist, but mainly a drawing practitioner. Her work has been selected for the Sedentary Exhibition of the British Society of Graphic and Fine Art at Moore Galleries, London 2021, and the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize 2021 and 22. In 2020, she joined CAST, Connecting Artists Stories Together, a global artist network. Her form is a former mentis to interpret the world. Over to you, Ariana. Thank you, Chloe. So my presentation is called Drawing Memory because this pandemic induced a brutal disruption of human connection and of the spatial temporal relationships in our life. This deprived us of some of the most useful landmarks to read into reality, urging us to find new direction, a flexible paradigm to consolidate memories and interpret past events. This paradigm should include a logical approach, but also intuition, dreams, and especially emotions. But how are we going on through this uncertainty? How's the process? In which conditions are we? I found that drawing was helping me to face and analyze these new needs. When I think of someone in lockdown, the first image that pops out in my mind is someone in prison, where every day looks the same, 
and therefore the sense of time, space, and memory is heavily disrupted. These graffiti are on the walls of a cell in the Piombi prison in Venice, from which Casanova escaped in the 18th century. The next picture in particular has a message of hope and strength. It is addressed to a future inmate and it gives a perspective. It means stay safe, be strong, this too shall pass. A 19th century way to say be positive, everything will be fine. Fast forward to 2020, an interesting parallel with those graffiti is the rainbow sign, which appeared in many windows all over the world, symbolizing the idea of spreading a positive message and of fixating a moment while in lockdown, regardless of how hard the moment might be. Unfortunately, a powerful absence of positive signs happened in Bergamo, my own town, nowadays sadly famous for how the city had been deadly hit by COVID. This situation led me to find a way using drawing to connect people, to make them travel in some way, to ask them how and where they were physically, but also emotionally in that moment. So I asked 70 friends from different parts of the world to send me a photo from one of their home windows with some few words about how they were when they took it. So for over two months, I drew a window per day and published them online on dedicated pages. Only later, I noticed that I had problems understanding how much time was passed since I started. In the same period, I read an article about Sir Isaac Newton, who during the Great Plague in the 17th century, was forced to escape Cambridge and spent a considerable amount of time at his family home, Woolsthorpe Manor. We believe that around that time, he started working on his theories of gravity and motion. One of the interesting things of Newton's house is that you can still see some of his drawings on the walls. As paper was expensive back then, he used walls to take notes and to remember the key points of his research. This is one of the drawings he made when he was a kid, which was apparently inspired by a mill in the neighborhood. I was lucky enough to visit Newton House a few months before the pandemic, and I saw those drawings. The article on Newton's I mentioned, though, implied that if you're not productive, you're wasting your time, which is a quite a depressing and capitalistic concept during a lockdown, when time appears to be circular and it's difficult to form new memories. Last year, I participated to a show about transitional objects. So I went back to my childhood, realizing how differently I saw the past events since the pandemic started. As a consequence, I felt the urge to focus my research on how isolation have influenced our current and past perception of time, space, and consequently memory. This can be seen in these drawings where connections among objects escape totally logic. Some elements can look randomly juxtaposed where they're strongly linked to one another by a quiet irrationality and by my need of rebuilding a new scenario, which must be updated and responding to this new sort of inferior setting. So I decided to start from the memories of my childhood and of my family that now evoke different feelings than before the pandemic. For instance, here, I drew my grandma in different contexts. I used to remember her strong personality, whereas these drawings revolve her around Indian feelings, like her fears or fun moments. This analysis sparked an inner emotional and temporal mess that I'm still facing with my drawings usually set at home. In this way, each object from a different perspective becomes a simulacrum that can host old memories or consecrate new ones, everyday events and details that achieve a different value than before. In these works, for instance, I mix elements from my childhood with ones of my everyday life. St. Lucy, who's the equivalent of Santa Claus in my hometown, is represented here by both a human form and by some of her symbols I studied at the university, including an ex-photo I was about to buy a few weeks ago. While in the next picture, you can find Tilde Teldi, an actress my grandma liked a lot, who's depicted inside a cup, which belonged to my grandparents, next to some mushrooms I recently saw on a tree, which lean over the hallway leading to my bedroom. This is a typical kind of emotional picture, which aims to subvert an obsolete hierarchy of past and present memories of mine. But drawing can also help establish an order of memories when we need to deal with the loss of someone, but we cannot do it with our friends and families because of the travel restrictions. When my uncle died, I couldn't go to his funeral, so I created a gallery of memories related to him to process my grief. This process of discovering and rearranging elements helps me nowadays to deal with the long pandemic necessities, to be more flexible, to push further my research. And this symposium, 
I think it's an unmissable opportunity to share and discuss my work and experience of the last two years with other drawing lovers and people. My primary aim in the end is to transform the current limitations in opportunities, both as a human being and as a drawing practitioner. Our memory is a sort of encyclopedia that we must sometimes redraw, a sort of geopolitical atlas that needs to be updated when borders fall down or are moved because of migrations. Sartre wrote that it's not important what people did to us, but what we do with ourselves after what they did to us. And this implies for me that what counts is our ability to react and change with our behavior art, which can hopefully help to shape and draw a better, more inclusive society. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You went on so many journeys within that constraint. Extraordinary. It gets so much to think about. Uh, over to Elke now, though. Elke Finkenhauer is a New Zealand German artist living in Glasgow. She explores the language of drawing through engagement with line, gesture, surface and process. Her drawings are of, often depict simplified forms. These seemingly casual and sometimes slightly awkward gestures develop into elaborate labor intensive works in materials, including textiles, metal, wood, beads, paper and print. Elke has an MFA at the Glasgow School of Art. Over to you, Elka. Thanks, Chloe. Over two years spanning the pandemic, I drew, I made a drawing, color study and description of 5,279 things in my studio. The things were fragments, tests, materials and tools. In doing this, I wanted to reflect on my practice and to think about why I had retained but not used these things. I also did it in part to see where it would take me. The project was guided by three rules. One, mistakes must be visible. Two, no new purchases. And three, no value judgments or quantifiable information. This drawing shows the beginning of a, tri a triangular wooden frame that I'd made from scraps of wood. The project became a marker of time and experience interwoven with the pandemic. It seemed ludicrous when I began it in October 2019, just before the pandemic kicked in but it quickly became a logical and even reassuring activity. This is part of a collection of 500 or so um, mostly unique buttons that I have. I began by drawing on loose paper, but I didn't trust myself not to throw some drawings away. And that would have broken rule one, which was mistakes must be visible. So I decided to stitch sketchbooks together to mitigate this risk. There are 19 sketchbooks with 742 drawing spreads inside. Acknowledging mistakes was an important part of the project. I tried first of all to accept them, which wasn't always easy, then work with them sometimes, and sometimes just to let them exist. This shows two different outcomes of mistakes, one worked with and one exaggerated by covering it with tipex. The no new purchases rule encouraged or maybe even forced me to be resourceful. I started out drawing on clean sheets of paper but was running out. So I used pages from art pub publications and documentation of previous works. This drawing is on a page from a 1950s catalogue of the National Gallery in London. The final rule, no value judgments or quantifiable information, was an attempt to avoid both opinions and facts. With the three approaches, drawing, colour and text, I was thinking about different ways of understanding something and how these complement one another whilst still offering an incomplete picture. The drawing techniques I used are often associated with warm-up exercises or breaking out of habitual thinking. They include fast drawing, drawing without looking, non-dominant hand drawing, overdrawing, and frottage. This is a frottage drawing of an apple cast in jasmine. Many of the drawings are on fluorescent paper, which was handed down to me from a studio mate. One way I conserved paper in the project was by drawing multiple items on one page. This drawing shows seven square stretched and primed canvases. Here I take drawing multiple items on one page to a logical conclusion. The challenge was keeping track of how many of these square, square beads I'd drawn. I counted 1,110. In the project, I drew each thing individually, but some color studies and descriptions cover more than one thing. This drawing of a dehydrated apple core is on tissue paper with Posca pen. 
These pens were great to work with because they allowed fast drawing and they didn't smudge or need fixing. The layering you can see here where drawings and backgrounds begin to seep into each other became an important characteristic of the project. Because a lot of the paper I used was already printed with images or text, some drawings became as much a response to ground as a depiction of a thing. I often drew the thing quite quickly and then spent a long time altering the ground so the drawing could be visible. This drawing is on a documentation of a previous work. The text in the National Gallery catalogue was oozing with judgments, especially in relation to male genius. This drawing of a tube and a piece of cello tape is on one of those pages, which is actually covered in text. Um, I remember this felt like a bad day, although I can't really remember why, and I drew so hard that the biro pierced the page. For the colour studies, I used felt pens, pencils and collage to match the colour of each thing as closely as possible. In a sense, the colour studies are the most realistic or accurate of the methods. This shows two pages of studies drawn quite early on in the project. An evolution in the colour studies happened when I was drawing the buttons. This was when I was experiencing bad anxiety at the end of the first lockdown and my studio had just reopened. The monotony of drawing the buttons was strangely reassuring. I think it also created a kind of space in which new things began to happen with the colour studies. So this is every single colour study for the whole project, um, which is 32 A4 pages. The order goes from top to bottom, left to right. It shows the kind of incremental accumulation of the project and also the way the studies started quite freeform but then rationalised over time. So some of the descriptions I wrote were perfunctory, some elaborate, which I haven't shown here, and others had narrative or diaristic qualities. Like the drawings, I didn't use a uniform method. I wanted to capture a process that was impacted by changing levels of diligence, enthusiasm, and mood, the kind of things that impact everyone every day. I also used a small amount of text in the sketchbooks. I saw it as a kind of drawing tool was kept capturing an observation or response quickly and importantly, leaving out some information. This shows about a third of the descriptions of the things, the 5,279 things at a font size of one point. As I progressed, I began to think of this project as a handmade data set, albeit analog, varied and experimental which are qualities you wouldn't normally associate with data. And here is every drawing and notebook spread. So this is kind of the sum of a two year warm up exercise and it, it's also a handmade data set. This kind of brings me back to why I began, which was to see where the project would take me. Now I'm thinking about how it might develop or be presented and how the data set might be used. Thank you so much. We were left with that beautiful buzzing kind of uh, dig like pixelated screen. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Um, Jayuki and Jingyu Cheng um, are currently research assistants. Well, Jayuki, sorry, Chi, sorry, I'm doing you separately here, is a research assistant at Art City Office, an architecture and urban curatorial think tank based in Shanghai in Shenzhen. She was a visiting student of Department of Architecture in the University of Cambridge and received a, a master's in architecture degree in architectural design and theory at Nanjing University. Jayuki, Jayuki has produced, published two papers on the architecture, on the papers in the architect and the new architect about design research. She has co-created, curated the online exhibition Working at Home, Architects During the Pandemic in China, supported by Architectural Humanities Research Association 2020 and University of Nottingham. I'm very sorry for my, my jumbled introduction. I hope everyone understood. There we go. Um, I'll start your slides. Yes, hello everyone. Our project name is the body of memory. Um, the epidemic has certainly made us think us a lot. Our experiment started with a simple question. What is the body? And how does the body connect objects to space? 
uh, does it become an agency or a media about the memory in the process? We tried to work with uh, four dancers who have the most, uh, we think who have the most free body language. We invited them to experience their own memories of their home of childhood. We think the home of childhood is the most familiar, familiar space for them. And we ask them to express their bodies in a limited grid. And we use three cameras to record the process from different directions. Um, dancers choose to dance with eyes closed because they think this, in this way they can be more immersive in their memories of their home. After that, we spent a lot of time to interview them and ask them to explain their body language and hand painting. We used the grid as the base of our exercise to serve as a basic position reference. Uh, this is the grid uh, for the base of our exercise. The first dancer, uh, whose name is Li Sijia, she is a 20 year old girl. From her hand drawings and the real house plans, we can see her memory of space is a relative uh, accurate. And this is uh, and this uh, image is the one of the uh, cameras from the top to record the uh, uh, dance process. This is the photo of the dancer Sijia and uh, uh, his uh, hand drawing, and uh, we also redraw her home in the uh, as the uh, architect did. Uh, for Sujia's first layer drawing, the this image shows where she stayed for a short time or a long time. Uh, she is doing some activities such as watching TV, cooking, and uh, sleeping. The first layer, we draw Sujia's trees and uh, her stopping point. Uh, this image is of Sujia's trees and uh, her, her stopping point. What's more, we find that each of her stay is linked with some objects or the furniture, such as TV, bed, bookcase. So we draw these furniture or objects uh, as a study, uh, dance her memory. And if we draw suggest room based on her activities, we can see that the spatial position of the room is far away from the real situation. It's not like uh, uh, her childhood's home. And after this analysis, we believe that Sujia's memory are existing as fields. So we use different types of hatch to represent her memory. The next step is the most important one because we decide to put this layer together for the next analysis. Just like uh, this model, we put together suggest a uh, layer. And we think in this way, we could get the girl's full memory of hope.
just like uh, this drawing. And this is the uh, memory of the first dancer. The second dancer is uh, 30. I think we may have lost her. We'll just wait. The slides will keep rolling. Um, what we'll do, we'll let the slides roll and then um, we'll get to the question and answers. Uh, also, what I could do is use this time because I didn't uh, read Jing Yu Cheng's uh, biography, which would be, <laughs> I didn't have time. So uh, Jing Yu, who also is the co-presenter here, um, the co-author of this work, artist, architect rather of this work, is a design assistant in South China University of Technology, Architectural Design and Research Institute Limited, based in Guangzhou. She was a visiting student of the Department of Architecture, University of Cambridge, and has received a master's in architecture degree of architecture design and theory at Nanjing University. Uh, their work focuses on large scale cultural buildings, museums, exhibition halls, galleries, and in her spare time, he runs, in, <clears throat> runs a social media based uh, company on Weibo, focusing on home life and product design. She was the executive curator of Embodied Imagination, 10 years of cinematic architecture, supported by AHRC and Land Studio. I think it's such a shame to have lost I know. <laughs> um, our speaker, but what an amazingly different perspective from where we started and an interesting transition from dealing with big public spaces to really analyzing really quite domestic, intimate spaces. So that translation of uh, through lockdown um, to actually starting to analyze uh, the space as a memory, uh, I thought was really rather beautiful and tender. So the, the, we've had a fantastic um, set of presentations again. And I think we might want to just take a question that came in earlier to the present presenters that we have. Uh, we don't have any specific questions for you as a group, but actually there is a question about seeing value in drawing. And I wonder whether one of the things that um, we might want to uh, think about is thinking about Sorry, I've just lost my moment. Um, but the is to think about that moment of, of a lot of this work is made very obsessively and very purposefully, very analytically about individual experiences during lockdown. So whether it's from Catcher's very extraordinary, uh, compelling and moving experience of surgery and being very, very ill uh, through to uh, an analysis through, you know, Joe's analysis of drawing breath um, that whole sense of, and Ariana's really registering everything in terms of history and what it's like to be in, in a, a cell uh, or in an isolation space and going to Newton's house, which seems serendipitous before lockdown. So there are lots and lots of things in there and Elka's uh, systematically documenting about how we use drawing to understand our state of mind, our condition that we're in, and maybe an opportunity to appraise uh, what that's like but that's about so my question really is the question that's being asked is that you've all developed a sense of confidence in your work and belief that it's relevant to a wider audience it's how have you developed the belief it's of relevance uh, but actually I'm guessing the question really is how do you develop confidence about the work and about making through drawing thinking through drawing analyzing the relationship with the world through drawing and at what point do you need to share it? And if what maybe only needs one answer. Um, I think we've got a lot to sort of thank the pandemic for because it has sort of like nudged us to share it online so much or to post drawings to each other so you can enjoy them sort of like 
you know, and feel the touch. And so I think there's an embodied and there's a psychological sort of drive through all of these. And it's very much about drawing as something you do as, as you breathe, as you exist and as part of your life and not having to separate it out. So I think sort of self-belief just it comes from not prejudging, isn't it? Just going on doing. I think that's right, Katya. And I think there's also the thing about reaching out in the pandemic. I mean, we, we heard from a number of speakers that they were truly in isolation. They didn't see anybody. And the power of both the combination of drawing and social media, um, you know, the capacity of Joe to hook up with this leading expert across the other side of the world, um, the openness that people may be developed as a kind of kindness and generosity uh, during this time uh, seems to me to be something that's been very, very unique. I don't know if anyone has any other comments or I think we probably should be moving on to uh, the third presentation so that we can see everything in our time frame. And I suspect we'll be being kind and generous with a little longer at the end for um questions at the end if everyone can bear with us on that so thank you chloe over to you uh, and over to the next five presentations which will be equally compelling it's an incredibly moving set of presentations um, and also life affirming at the same time it is thank you um so we're on to the last part And we begin with Karen Conway, who lives in Galway City beside the Atlantic Ocean on the west coast of Ireland. She completed a residency with the National University of Ireland and the Science Foundation of Ireland in 2019 and was awarded a COVID-19 Special Project Award in 2020 from the Arts Council of Ireland, which enabled her to develop further subject matter focusing on the medtech pharma industry in Ireland. She worked predominantly through drawing and was shortlisted for the Trinity Boy Walk Drawing Prize in 2020, 2021. Her work was acquired by Erigen Pharma and Nova, Novartis Island in 2021, and is also held in the Crawford Municipal Art Gallery Collection and Microsoft Island. She teaches in Galway City. I'll just give you that slide back, Karen. There you go. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Chloe. Good to see you. Um, uh, so the first slide that we're looking at um, today is uh, a drawing that was on my wall when the lockdown was called here um, on the 12th of March 2020. So the Irish government called the lockdown and we were just told to go home from school and work and take everything and go. Um, and that drawing was based, it was, a, I was on a residency that summer in the university here in Galway. Um, and that work was part of that. I was finishing up with that body of work. So I was struck by the fact that, you know, you couldn't be in a lab anymore. Um, this is uh, an image, one of the drawings I would have made in the laboratory. Um, it's an experiment. Um, and I would have, would have had a sketchbook in there and I would have been allowed to work with the researchers in the laboratory. Um, and this is um, part of that project insofar as it was a community-based project and it, it was, I was working with a cardiologist as well as uh, the public and the students were talking about their local architecture, the, uh, the architecture of the area resembling the heart. Um, so in, the, in this slide here you see the, the local school um, and it was like the different chambers of the heart, they were relating to the community being the, the, the heart, the heart of the community, the buildings there were representational of that. Um, and going back to that drawing, I, it was quite disjointed and I wasn't sure how to finish it. And um, then when the COVID situation hit, the most natural thing in the world really was to, to add, you know, the images were coming out of this kind of spiky, furry thing. Um, and I, I just felt it was necessary to put that in. And also I referenced the cardiologist I was working with, with the heart and the lungs. And you can see here the sketches where I was trying to figure out, well, what, what else did this drawing need? And in the end, I decided it didn't need anything because it was representational of the, uh, 
the 5k walk that we that everyone's allowed to do you weren't allowed to go any far, further than the 5k um because the galleries were shut this work was disseminated and shown on buildings and again that was quite poetic really in a way that um the buildings the drawings of buildings were then projected back onto the buildings this this drawing here is of my daughter um, she was um she was on an erasmus in helsinki at the time of the lockdown um, that you know when it was all very scary and it was will i come home will i not come home what will i do um, so she came home and this was a picture of her um, at the airport. Um, this is the detail from that drawing. Um, and it's a drawing about drawing. Um, I was really looking at different methods of drawing. Uh, the line, what can a line do for me? Weights of uh, different pencils. Uh, I listening to a lot of music, which uh, I was delighted to be able to do since I, I wasn't formally in work but working from home which brought me some extra time to work on these drawings um, they're very large they're six foot and they're also all done it from a domestic space at home um, so they're they're very much integrated into i suppose my home life um chloe mentioned there that i was awarded the covid 19 project award which was um it afforded me the opportunity to link in with the med tech industry here who um, I suppose universally we were all looking to find a vaccine. Um, this is of the factory, one of the factories in Cork. I linked in through Zoom calls and video calls um, with a number of agencies who were, who were very generous with their time and their information and their photographs. Um, this is one of the drawings I started. Um, you can see the scale of it here and also you can see my method of working. Um, I don't use projectors or tracings, I just hand draw everything um, from the images that I have and they kind of organically grow out. Um, the structure kind of works its way as, as the drawing progresses. Um, this was the laboratory. Um, this is my, my second twin daughter to references her because she was doing a, a biochemistry degree, but she, you couldn't she couldn't get into the laboratory either. So there, there's kind of bits of auto, autobiography as well as um, um, the reference to machines to farm out. So it kind of um, crosses over a little bit here with um, I, I would have done an awful lot of machinery and devices before. Um, again, this this is kind of I like this because of the lines in it. It's the factory, um, and yeah, it's 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 really just about a line. Each each little section is uh, a kind of separate technique that I'm looking at there, um, and then the drawing finished up then in. It's the it's the bioreactor, and then it goes through this process through the factory into the vaccine. And it was actually when the vaccine was announced on the TV that uh, you know we finally found the vaccine, and and uh, we didn't know what to expect then. This drawing here is of Salt Hill, which is um, you know one of my lockdown areas. I would have walked around it with my five k, and it was around about the time the the fatigue was setting in, and people were getting kind of annoyed that they only could walk a certain amount. Um, and I referenced the work of a Norwegian philosopher, uh, Zappa, who I'm probably pronouncing wrong there, um, the Messiah, um, the last Messiah. And this is this work presented in the studio gallery space in Gage Art Studios in Galway, um, when they finally, you know, we were finally allowed to open and show to the public. And I had the use of the space for a week. Um, and the final slide here is um, the starting of my drawing um, again during another lockdown, um, which became the drawing that went into this year's uh, for our last year's Trinity Boy Wharf uh, Prize exhibition. Um, I was kind of fed up about, you know, trying to keep drawings clean. So I decided to start off with them like that. So just thanks a million to Anita and Chloe. And uh, I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. I love I love the scale in the domestic place space. Always, you just <laughs> make it as big as possible in the small in the small spaces that you have. It's wonderful. Um, See, so you is a PhD candidate in architect in architecture at the University of Nottingham. She graduated from Peking University with a master's degree of geography, urban and regional planning. Her research interests include drawing and critical visual practice 
and the intersection between housing, domesticity, and urbanism. Over to you, see you. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, yes, uh, it's okay. It's a silly mistake. Um, but yeah, what I'm going to share today is a research project that we conducted during the first lockdown in 2020. It focuses on architects working, home working scenarios during the pandemic based on drawings, both um, architects and my own. It involves 20 architects from five major cities in China. They were interviewed and asked to do a sketch uh, describing their live work experience. So um, we did some uh, measured drawings and diagrams of 10 architects' home. Uh, we applied the architectural uh, drawing conventions to everyday uh, space objects and practices, emphasizing their importance as sites of spatial studies. Although a uh, commercialized and homogeneous uh, typology could be found in their dwelling units, their use scenarios were diverse and ambiguous. For instance, for instance in this drawing of a uh, minimal home, um, it maps the uh, habitual patterns of eating, working, and socializing in a fixed position at the table and shows how the uh, closed circles of the mouth inscribing in the virtual world project into the real world. Um, drawing inhabitation, uh, tracing patterns of inhabitation movement uh, in real and virtual realm. It calls for um, following individual routines habits and uh, modes across the uh, space of work desk to the neighborhood and the city by allowing the overlap and the collapse of different scales and domains into one perceptual realm. Varied relations were activated and more possibilities were explored. Um, the drawings, as Robert Evans uh, insisted, is not just much uh, a projection of an idea. Um, it tries to create a particular reality of its own. Here are some more cases uh, when the domestic and social practices uh, are uh, put together spontaneously in the drawing of the room furniture and activities, we can perceive them all at once, uh, not seeing them unfolding sequently like the language would uh, make us do. And uh, yeah. So more uh, architect home cases. And in, in this case, um, the architect couple occupied two apartments from before the pandemic. Uh, like many uh, successful architectural practices, their workspace involved from the bedroom to a separate studio, but they didn't um, rent an office, but brought an apartment in the same neighborhood and changed it into a studio. Here are the drawings by themselves. It shows their home territory is multi-centered and constantly changing as their lives unfold. Also the drawings underscore the richness of their lived experience uh, stemming from community and intellectual pursuit, allowing a culture of communication and uh, intellectual exchange uh, as well as um, architectural production and display. Yeah, um, there are more cases that showing the similar situation. This one is called a home of two identical units. So during the pandemic, the couple lived, uh, worked, entertained separately in those two units and during the night and went back to uh, their original unit to uh, relax. Um, in the end, although our drawing um, aspired in a small way to help everyday life to push back against modern uh, modernity, to continue to uh, it, it, it continued to operate within the rule of uh, architectural uh, orthographic projection. So I questioned how to open up the drawing conventions to explore more possibilities and to expand 
the potential of architectural drawing. So here's what I did. Um, I try to allow memories or imaginations of experience of history of people that are distant in time or space to come into the drawing. And more importantly, I try to uh, follow the approach of creation and uh, perception that's capable of bring together the movements of making, observing, and describing. So I paid more emphasis to the embodiment in the drawing and think through the drawing instead of uh, representing what's already happened in the past. So by allowing my drawing to be both vague and precise, um, additional openness might be achieved somehow. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. What exciting drawings they were. Wow. <laughs> this is, again, so much to think about. I don't know where to begin. Oh, but we have to go to Nick now. Thank you. Nick works at SVA Stroud, shortlisted artist um, for the Joa Drawing Prize in 2016 and the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize in 2020. Um, she is also a mentor for young artists in Stroud. Her practice centers on drawing, collage, assemblage, and textiles using playful visual language and simple materials, looking at the difficulties and inadequacies inherent in verbal communication. Her work draws, draws on ambiguity, uh, misinterpretation, the tenderness within autobiographical narratives, and the inseparability of the tragic and the comic. Over to you, Nick. Thank you. Um, on May the 31st, 2019, I was in the studio I shared with another drawing artist talking about drawing in sketchbooks regularly as part of our practice. We didn't do enough of it. So we decided to start a year long project making one drawing a day and we post them on Instagram so that we were obliged to keep going. We began the next day. The news was mainly full of Brexit. And the first one I made was an unfinished text and collage, no exit, partly to cajole myself. We weren't drawing together or making similar work, just encouraging each other. I promised that I would keep the 20 centimeter square sketchbooks intact, but within a couple of weeks, as is usual in my work, I started to dismantle them so that I could look at the drawings properly. After a month or so of drawing things, I started to use the process to record thoughts. I've always used the pricks and bruises of collage to get over the problem of the initial impetus. And these drawings are as much collage as drawing, symbiotic and supportive technologies for me. I use low value, easily accessible materials in most of my work paper, pencil, ink, glue, erasers, and printed material, which tie the work to verbal language and communication. Many of the drawings have text embedded in them, which developed as part of the visual language, but titles or accompanying text became equally weighted over time. As the year went on, the subjects of the drawings became more intimate and wide. COVID happened about eight months in, and the drawings tracked the seams of the unknowable progress of fear and not touching. We finished the year and stopped. It was really good to stop. I had an exhibition of the drawings and made a book entitled Today. Seeing the drawings consecutively on the wall was useful and putting them back into a book from the most recent back to the first established the linear and circular cycle of the project. Later on during the first year of this project, I started being regularly interviewed by drawing artist Emily Lucas as a subject in her autobiographical drawing PhD, making their mark, why artists draw an interrogation of drawing as a subjective autobiographical and emotional act. Lucky for me, as she transcribes the conversations and lets me have them to plunder at will. We discuss feminist gesture, material value, shame, and humor. One of the drawings, No Backbone, was shortlisted for Trinity Boy Drawing Wolf Prize 2020, which opened at the same time as my exhibition. I gave some talks and workshops, one called Mistakes of God, for Drawing is Free Drawing Prize in Residence. I talked about found marks, collecting, play, repetition, fluidity between words and images, and the absurdities of verbal communication while the audience worked on their own piece. I never particularly intended to carry on, but after six months, I suddenly missed it, missed it and started again on December the 1st, 2020. The possibility of failure of a drawing being bad and therefore productive was motivation. There would be another one tomorrow, so it didn't matter what happened. In the second series, I had a lot more confidence in letting the process direct things. I suppose there's quite a lot of anger in them as I let go and stopped thinking they had to be good or nice. The poignancy of what is both funny and sad or awful is at the center of these drawings, and it's what connects them with people who look at them. People often ask me if, or assume that, this is a lockdown project. And there are many drawings looking at aspects of the virus, especially evident when seen together on the wall. I had been un unintentionally documenting a life before and during these weird times. My dad has Alzheimer's and I care for him twice a week. The awful hilarity of his deterioration often dropped into my thoughts and drawings. 
I'm interested in the punctum, the thing that makes a work have that small splinter that makes a jolt, often something that seems wrong or mistaken. During this second series, I realized that it was okay to let out the weirdness and humor in my head and make real connections with other people. People often want to know which drawing is my favorite drawing or how long they take, what time of day I do them, and do I reject any and start again? Do the titles come first? And also, how do I do them? When I exhibit them all together, the best responses for me aren't those questions, but the times when people stay for ages just looking and sometimes laughing. Making drawings in college like this so regularly and over a long time has changed how I work and my understanding of working with unexalted techniques and materials, how crossovers and threads within my practice are tied together through context and language, that the methods and materials I use depend on what the work needs, not what I should do to make my practice seem cohesive. From the beginning of the project, I can, I can track the inevitable advance of my dad's brain disease. Sometimes things are gaspingly funny, but often it seems that he's disappearing in front of me. This and lots of other subjects of these drawings seem to me to have had a visceral effect on how my eyes and hands work with deteriorating materials and wobbly lines with just paper, pencil and ink. While making the drawings, I was halfway through studying three year MA fine art at UE Bristol. At first, the course seemed to have a definite conceptual ethic and blokey atmosphere. It felt like a bold step to come in with a load of very small drawings with figures and body parts, but actually it was okay. Autobiographical durational drawing had validity and purpose. I was unintentionally uncovering buried memory as well. I didn't manage a whole year of drawings this time. I was starting to bore myself and a good filmmaker friend who says it like it is without fail suggested that I might like to stop. I thought I should at least get to 600, but she said, why? Stop now. The drawing I'd done that day was Space Junk 597. It was the day that Jeff Bezos sent his Blue Origin up to join all the other big extensions in space. And I was happy to stop there as it seemed okay. Probably quite a few of the drawings have a jab at the patriarchy, and this was the star kissed and made me laugh, so I stopped. I called the second book Space Junk and exhibited the drawings in the same format as before at SVA Stroud. The exhibition had excerpts of interviews with Emily Lucas, and as we seem to be constantly both laughing, that's what the excerpts are collectively called. In March, Emily and I are doing a three-week residency at the Garage Bristol to play with materials and subjects that we've looked at in the conversations. We plan to be playful, honest, and free of defined outcomes. We think we'll make some protest work, probably some posters and lists and badges and an installation. Drawing is in everything. It is noun and verb. It moves off the page. It is a medium, a product, an activity. Drawing is thinking. Drawing is experience emanating by the body through the hand. It is a shared language, an Esperanto, an ancient and universal technology. I've always drawn, but the simple practice of documenting daily and at length really has changed just about everything I understand about how I make work how I think about what I make, and that I can be deeply instinctive and survive the honesty. Thanks. Sorry that what, it was a bit. <laughs> what energy, no, but it was so engaging. Thank you, amazing. Something about ritual and amount as well that lo links lots of you here, which might come up in the questions. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Jane Hildreth, Nay Thomas is an artist who retired at the start of January, 2020. She's now a private art tutor, art lecturer and teacher magazine editor and designer, and she's a graduate of the Royal College of Art in 1980. Over to you, Jane. Okay, hi. All right, thank you for inviting me. Quick hi to David, who um, we do London Drawing Workshop with. So um, my pandemic project started on the 17th of April, 2020. I drew some uh, photographs that I'd taken on my daily walk and a friend saw this and in turn took a photo and I drew it and that, um, and I drew that and on it went really. In total, I drew 50 photos from friends and acquaintances. For each one, I sent a daily update. It's in this way that my isolation was diminished and I was re rewarded by the communication, both through Zoom and WhatsApp renewing old relationships and nurturing existing ones. As we go through this presentation, I'd like to read to you, starting with some brief parts from this essay by the director of the Anima Mundi Gallery in St. Ives, Joseph Clark, who kindly gave me permission to do so. He starts with part of a poem by William Wordsworth. I first read this essay just on Wednesday and in doing so changed my plans for the presentation. 
So visually, you're getting what I planned, but actually what you're going to listen to is going to be different. Um, so his, uh, he starts with a, um, a poem, part, and I'm going to read part of a poem by William Wordsworth, which he starts with. The world is too much with us. The world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon, this sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything we are out of tune, it moves us not. So he called his essay, The Disorientated Deliberations of a Hopeless Romantic. Romanticism, romanticism, the wild and untamed edict which offered up a counterpart point to those more civilized and sensible concerns of enlightenment. Romantics like Wordsworth occupied a time and space where the forces which today ravage the world were finding form. Waging, uh, war, waging rage against the machine for the human heart born of mother nature and father spirit. Theirs was a calling for an urgent return to something ancient and deeper, not for nostalgic or sentimental reasons, but to reconnect the human soul with that of the world that lies beyond it. They knew that at the core of their process was something intangible and immeasurable. In life through nature and through love, there are moments when I have lost myself and become entwined and entangled with a sense of the great unnameable force embedded in the world itself, running through all living things and perhaps extending beyond the sublime, its beauty and its power and my connection to it, despite my smallness, the fear of its magnitude, my humility in the face of it, an infinitely turning wheel of joy, pain, tears, blood, death, and rebirth, a wild energy of bewitching complexity and enchantment. There is a greatness that cannot be found within this human world alone, and a growing absence in the world that we conjure. That's just a small part of his essay. I'm going to put, I think I've, hopefully this is going to work. Yes, great. So I've put in the chat, um, where you can read the whole of this piece of work. So this essay has resonated with me, and I believe that some of us have been both prior to the pandemic and during lockdown, given the freedom to engage with our world and see and be aware of nature personally. I recognize the deep need we have to communicate with each other. The political turmoil and distraction from climate change has been infuriating as I work hard to participate and help where I can. Coming back to the project, the response from those who took part in it and how my life and art were challenged by it made me love working in this collaborative way. Drawing for a few hours a day honed my thinking and senses to the memories I have of the person who sent the photo. It's also amazing how one's mind actually just wanders about. Um, delighted at times, disturbed by the memories. I was involved with interpretation and I brought to each the limitations of my own rules of being the technical interpreter and not the sole creator. The key has been that I have made marks, evolved them and enjoyed the process for over a year. And this daily practice rewarded with me with a love of collaboration and interaction with others, both alive and no longer with us. Have we got a problem with the slides? You've just, you've come to the end of your slide, this so I switched it. But... <laughs> slides, Jane. So I just I. Oh, I bless you! I won't be long. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Finally, the work I'm doing now is underpinned and nurtured by my pandemic project. Um, the continuing experimentation developed from some of my rather formal drawings are also keeping me busy and alive. The drawing postcards, which these pencil drawings are of, are ones that I have received since the 1970s. They are objects from others. And I'm going to stop because that's unfair. I'll stop. I'm so sorry. Okay, thanks. Thank thanks, you. Chloe, for your patience with that. Um, it's a bit of a, a, a jumbles uh, because I wanted to include that amazing um, 
essay which resonated with my very formalized drawing work that I've been doing during the pandemic and the interaction because it's a collaboration between me and the person who sent the photo. So that's something which is echoed with others. I'll get off now. Bye. I, Thank I you have very to much say it, it was a great <laughs> pleasure. It was a great pleasure to listen and what and 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 look at the drawings at the same time. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Gary um, is a U Gary Clough is a UK based practicing artist with an interdisciplinary approach spanning drawing, embroidery, sculpture, animation, and sites such as specific installation. His research focuses on the importance of recording and responding through sketchbooks and journals. The sketchbooks are intrinsic to his practice. They operate both as both virtual and literal studio and cognitive landscape. Gary has traveled throughout the world in his academic roles and as an artist. Um, he has over 30 years of experience in art and design higher education and is the head of program for the Royal College of Arts graduate diploma in art and design. I'll let you start properly with your slide, Gary, go, go ahead. <laughs> thank, thank you very you. much indeed, Chloe, and thank you everyone for today. Um, yeah, there and back again. Um, this is where uh, myself and Bilbo Baggins part company. Um, what we have in common, I suppose, is leaving, returning and engaging um, with the world around us and recording and responding. The sketchbook is absolutely fundamental to what I do. Um, and its intrinsic mobility is very much part of my practice. In some ways, we've talked a lot about this notion of self-isolation. Well, maybe I self-isolated the sketchbook about 20 years ago, and I'm still trying to deal with that. But it, it is part of my practice in a sense. It's a way of compartmentalizing time. And so the sketchbook became a place which was completely linked to travel linked to journeys on the train to and from work, linked to research visits, working, whether it's sitting on a plane or train, whether it's those moments where you could sort of rethink about things, or those liminal moments in time, like the back of a taxi cab, being mm -hmm. Joe, and engaging with what was going on with the world around you, and then trying to re-understand it when you return to the sketchbook. So this, as, as I said, this notion of the virtual studio, a studio space that was both a place for thinking and looking. Also a place where events were, you know, this is, this is Brexit. This is the um, night of the votes coming in. This is me looking at the laptop, me thinking about objects I've seen throughout the day. The sketchbook was always a place where I could really bring things together, whether it was a notion of sort of talking to myself, instructing or thinking about instruction, but thinking about the language of the way we talk through drawing about experiences that are not of drawing, experiences that are of both memory or that sense of invention. The sketchbook becomes a place where overlay of information is intrinsic to what I do. The notion that things may be revisited. Pages live across more than one period of time. It's not just a drawing of a moment. Quite often I will return to a page, overdraw, redraw, things will come through the pages, I'll respond. I often use systems within the sketchbook as a starting point. So then I suppose as a sculptor who made the decision or asked the question whether or not something's drawn should be made, again, over 20 years ago, it's this sense of using systems to work within. Then we get to the point of the pandemic. And suddenly, you know, we've got a situation where these moments, very intrinsic, very defined within my practice were removed and everything was thrown in together. So both sort of domestic time, work-based time, engagement with people, retreat from people, retreat with from the world was in one place. So suddenly this new landscape emerged, a landscape where basically the sketchbook was no longer just something that was resigned to the bag and brought out key points as a, as a place of escape in a way. Suddenly there was no escape, everything was one place. So the periphery around the nature of this laptop space became really important and it actually started developing and the sketchbook and the space around it became one thing. And it was a really insightful and very, very important part of the way I started practicing because as well as these sort of blotter type moments around the computer screen, I was still then taking them back to the sketchbook and the sketchbook and these spaces were interchangeable at times. 
and as well as the types of materials as well. I was starting to draw things from, you know, the back of the envelope that was on the table, which found its way to where I was working. And then sort of, I was moving things around in a relatively small space. And so these notions of objects and landscapes. So at some times I was using the sketchbook to almost draw the spaces that I was in through, through a space that was really constructed through drawing, um, not one that was just an observation of a space, but an observation of a moment in time, an observation of a working pattern. Other aspects of these sort of sketchbooks was to actually integrate stuff. So they became both archive as well as sort of a, a living archive and a working space. They became playful. There was a sense of still returning to objects, still using these structures. I think the structure in a way became even more important because we were in a point where there was a lack of structure and uncertainty about structure. The envelopes really became very important. I think, again, it's a very simple sense of the window, you know, the windowed envelope. It was a place to look through, to look out of, to look back. And also one that was fundamentally contained and controlled. And I suppose that notion of containing and controlling became very important. These two pages show aspects of the sketchbook where I was integrating work from the desk, bringing it back into the sketchbook, but then working through it and onto it. And also this things that I found that I forgot I had and reinvestigating them. The moire internal aspect of the um, envelope became very important because it became like a grid and a system itself. Also, the materials that became available were very much those of those things that I would normally have had in my pocket on my travels, but now they became a box. And I think that ability to dip in and out became so important. These two pages, again, or these two separate double page spreads, talk about these notions of frameworks, whether it's an architectural framework or it's a framework of writing. The notion of writing around something, containing something, that point where writing and drawing merged, quite uncontrollably, really. Now, what we have here is where I am now. These are sort of pages of a number of sketchbooks, well over about 20 years, that have been photocopied together and then rebound, put together in yet another sketchbook and then drawn back into. So we've got like this drawing machine or facsimiles of sketchbook pages, a language of sketchbooks, a world of sketchbooks. And I think in these two, what you're starting to see is a sense that that workspace that I've become into is now becoming a virtual space again. That I'm coming back to that sense now that I'm reconstituting a space or reinvestigating, but fundamentally open to the possibilities of how drawing can actually lead you into and out of an experience. And I suppose for me, that was the most important thing for lockdown and that period. And then these last two images, you can see that sort of, I suppose, collision of drawing, but also drawing as a way of taking you both from the beginning and to the start of a discussion. So thank you very much. That was amazingly put, that idea of that drawing leads you in and out of an experience that, that you know, that we, everyone has, has, has shared that today. Um, but it was a particularly and particularly um, beautifully in what you, you just described. Thank you. I'm in the dark in my home now. I'm just going to, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing. And I know Anita will be taking questions. Um, um, that, that's, I am well, going to take questions. I'm conscious that we're time. over our advertised time. Yeah, but if people exactly. are happy to stay with us just for five to 10 minutes. I mean, I think my comment would be one, what a beautifully curated session that, and that transition between writing and drawing and the need to express and communicate through drawing and action and the sense of drawing providing a window on the world. Um, but I think, again, five extraordinarily compelling presentations that really have addressed the sense of transition in our experience of the world and the sense of withdrawing from something that we took for granted, our mobility. And both Nick's work and yours, Gary, your projects both talked about what it was before to what it was after. And Karen's evocation of the 5K limit, you know, some of these things are things that are starting to disappear in our memory and not least as these other memories and actions of other people uh, in public life are starting to 
to generate. And I think one of the fabulous things is actually how much drawing it's true of the exhibition uh, this year, which is partly why we themed the symposium during lockdown, but also all of your presentations testify to the capacity of drawing to both enable us to understand what we're going through, but also actually to claim a position in the world. And I think one of the things that's been really powerful today has been that sense that drawing as thinking and drawing as action and drawing that can accommodate memory and experience. So it both documents, reflects, and that wonderful space, that warp and a weave between all of those actions and thoughts and intentions is such a powerful uh, message to take away, I think, from the symposium. So I you know, I can only be super grateful to everybody for sub submitting, and we, we did choose you from a, a wide range of very uh, fantastic presentations too. So there are, I think questions have been answered in the type in the Q&A box. There are fantastic comments in the chat and I couldn't agree more that that's been a superb conclusion to what's been the most stunning afternoon. Um, and I think the, the metaphoric window, the metaphoric connection and the capacity that all of you have leveraged to make connections beyond the spaces that we directly occupy uh, has been astonishing. So I'm not seeing a question come in unless anybody wants to, to shout, but what I would like to say is a really heartfelt thank you to everybody who's presented today. There have been stunning presentations from many perspectives across the world and many perspectives about our worlds that we've occupied in this extraordinary time. It's been rich, inspiring, imaginative, sharp, hard hitting and powerful. And I'd like to say one enormous thank you to Chloe, uh, as drawing is free for convening this session. We do have another part two to come on the 5th of March, and we will put up the event booking fairly close to the time as well, but we will be sharing that uh, on the Drawing Projects UK Eventbrite page of website and on our social media. And I believe, Chloe, there is an open call for that too. We're very much thinking about how drawing communities and draw learning through drawing has developed through lockdown. So some of the things that some of you have given a segue to, uh, but we really wanted to think about how uh, people have started to draw together and I, we've seen both from David's and Jane's presentation and a number of you and um, how much it's been really important to draw together and to connect and make sense of the world through this very simple activity using social media, using your hand, whatever materials are to hand um, and to make that connection wherever you've come from in the drawing world and drawing experience and what you have formed is an astonishing community. And I hope it's a resilience around drawing that can really grow from here and can actually talk as a document to our time about the power of drawing, the power of being human and the power of actually understanding what we've just gone through and what we're still living through. So I'd like to say one enormous thank you to all 15 of our presenters, to everybody who submitted a proposal, to Chloe as our super host, as Drawing is Free, and for all the work that she does around all of this. I'd like to thank Fiona Cassidy in the background for Drawing Projects UK, keeping us all on in line. And we're only 15 minutes over. The film will probably be two hours to the sec when we get it uploaded. It will be on the Drawing Projects UK YouTube channel for everyone to be able to go back and reflect on. And I have to say there's so much to... Uh, reflect on and to uh, distill uh, as an overall experience. I'm sure that there's a conversation that will continue for some time. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us and we look forward to welcoming you soon. Further drawing discussions at Drawing Projects UK Tuesday evening and Saturday till the end of the show uh, and we finish as the finale uh, at Drawing Projects UK with part two of Drawing Lockdown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.